in chapter 8, and we're looking at verses 31 through 39 this morning. I don't know if we'll be able to cover the whole of that section, but it's a wonderful um, summary of what Paul has brought to our attention thus far. It's kind of an application to uh, what we have discovered with regard to our justification in Christ. And so let me read the text for you, and then we'll make our way through it together. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We've come to a point in, in Paul's argument where he uh, has uh, shown us the implications of our predestination, how we are chosen in Christ before the worlds were formed. And then uh, God in history and time calls us to himself, justifies us, and will indeed glorify us. And these uh, uh, descriptions of God's activity emphasize the sovereignty of God in salvation, how God is one who acts unilaterally on his own. He is the uh, uh, sovereign Lord of history and time. And so he works according to his plan and brings, uh, brings about the, the salvation of his elect people according to his will. So um, Paul brings us to a very strong conclusion there at the end of verse 30 by saying that uh, those he predestined, he called, those he called, he justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. Now, the one thing that we noted as we were going along here is this continuing uh, note of adoption through the whole text that uh, we are uh, brothers together in Christ. We are uh, with Christ. He is the firstborn among many brothers. Um, we all have this union with Christ uh, as members of God's family. Christ is the unique Son of God, uh, eternal in the heavens. Uh, we, on the other hand, are adopted children, finite creatures, always uh remaining creatures. So we have here um, this wonderful privilege that Paul ushers us into here, uh, reminding us that we are indeed the very children of God. So now in verse 31, Paul raises the question, what then shall we say to these things? I love the fact how Paul uses a kind of argumentative style to uh, develop ideas, advance his thinking, consider objections to his arguments and answering them. Um, it, it, when he raises this question, what then shall we say to these things? He's inviting his audience to get uh, engaged in the argument here, to, to respond by thinking for themselves, what are the implications of all that we've come through thus far? You can see that Paul does this on a number of occasions here. Um, he, he does this in uh, 
chapter 4, verse 1. Let me just go to that here quickly. Uh, same language. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? So he, he's um, advancing his argument from the, the uh, presentation of our justification through Christ, through his propitiation for our sins in chapter 3. And now he's using a, a test case for that. What did Abraham, the forefather of faith, uh, experience in his life in terms of his own justification. And so Paul takes us uh, into a new topic and, and amplifies our understanding of our justification in this way. Uh, he does that again, I believe, in chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, same sort of thing. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Uh, this follows up on... Uh, what Paul had to say about our union with Christ uh, in view of our union in Adam. Adam is our federal head, and through him, sin and death uh, extended to all his descendants. In Christ, we are set free from sin and death. Uh, we are now slaves of obedience, slaves of God. Um, and so let's develop that further. Now that we've been set free from sin, can we live as we please? Well, uh, Paul asks his readers to engage in this and to think through, are we to continue in sin that grace might abound? And in so doing, he's answering an objection that uh, the cynics, the skeptics, the unbelievers might have, uh, the critics of this understanding of justification by saying, well, if you believe that we're saved entirely by grace through faith alone and not as a result of works, then isn't the implication then that you can live as you please because you are already justified? Well, Paul wants you to think this thing through. And so we get back to uh, our text here in Romans 8, uh, where Paul once more encourages us to think these things through. What shall we say to these things? I want to make a couple comments about that. One is that uh, there, uh, we should not be afraid of using logic and reasoning in developing our understanding of God and his ways. Uh, there are some who object to Calvinism or the Reformed faith because they say, well, it's very reasonable, but reasonable, but it follows human reasoning. And so when you think about the five points of Calvinism in particular, and you think about total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints, um, you say, well, there's this chain of reasoning, much like we had earlier in Romans 8, verses 29 and 30. You have a chain of reasoning here, and there's a logical development here. If uh, there's total depravity and all are given over to sin, then uh, and, and utterly incapable of saving themselves, then if anyone is going to be saved, it must be by God in entering into the system and making a change. And so there's unconditional election. It had to be unconditional because if it was conditional on obedience, no one would be saved because we're all in this mess of sin. And so God's choice of us is unconditional. It doesn't look at anything that we accomplish or achieve or do uh, in order for us to be saved. He chooses us freely on, on his own. And so that flows logically from total depravity. Once you accept total depravity, everything else follows reasonably from that. Unconditional election. And the next is limited atonement. And, and this is where some folks in the evangelical world get upset and they say, well, you're following this reasoning too far. Yes, admittedly, God chose a people, set them apart for himself in Christ. And then Christ comes into this world and pays a penalty for their sins. That is reasonable. That's compact. That's efficient. Uh, logically, um, th there are no gaps there in the logic. But they say, you're following human reasoning and uh, jumping over passages of Scripture which are universalistic in their nature. For God so loved the world, they say, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him. 
And so these uh, apparently universal claims to salvation then are held to as uh, defying this uh, concept or this doctrine of limited atonement. Now, uh, I appreciate the, the interest in following the word of God, even in those areas where we do not understand or cannot perceive the reasoning behind what God's word has to say. That is a very pious position to take. On the other hand, maybe there should be a question with regard to our understanding of those universalistic passages and what they intend to teach. Maybe we should go and revisit that universalist uh, passage and say, isn't there a way to understand that in view of other texts of Scripture where Jesus lays his down his life for his sheep? He dies for them and for them alone and not for, if you will, the goats or those outside of his fold, John chapter 10. So would you not consider that you need to correct your understanding of some of these passages like John 3.16 and say, maybe John is not inferring that all men are the objects of God's love and all men are the objects of Christ's death on the cross so that they might all be saved. Doesn't that get you into some uh, great difficulties with regard to the fact that there is a hell and that there are people who will perish? If Christ paid the sins of everyone, how is it that some could yet nonetheless be condemned and judged? Uh, you have an injustice there. So, um, Paul reminds us that we need to think logically and reasonably because we are made in the image of God who himself is logical and reasonable. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord, uh, Isaiah chapter 1 says. Uh, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Um, there is divine covenantal reasoning that we need to appreciate. Reasoning that's based on the word of God and uh, adheres to it. What we don't hold to is humanistic reasoning, unbelieving reasoning, uh, man's reasoning that is hostile to God and his word, which inevitably makes mistakes and confuses things and self-contradicts itself, and so therefore false, shows itself to be uh, uh, false and dangerous. Uh, we don't believe in that kind of human reasoning based on human foundations, but we believe in the reasoning that God gives us in his word, reasoning out of the scriptures and being faithful to what God's word has to say. So, uh, if I can follow that through, limited atonement, then irresistible grace. God draws irresistibly the elect to himself and no others. He brings them to Christ and covers them with the, the effect of his saving offering of himself at the cross, and then God preserves those who are chosen, those who are drawn to Christ. He preserves them till they are glorified. Again, the, you see this in what Paul had to say here at verse 30. Uh, those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Uh, and that's limited atonement there. The justification of those who are in Christ. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. There is this chain of reasoning here. So the, the Reformed believer is not hostile to reasoning, to moving from premises to conclusions in ways which are consistent with uh, uh, the, the subject. And so we need to uh, not be afraid of reasoning. We want to make use of reasoning uh, covenantally in faithfulness to Scripture and um, I think that will be blessed. And so Paul raises this thing, what shall we say to these things? Uh, he, he's talking about the immediate context where he considered the fact that believers uh, in this life suffer quite a bit. Uh, we are in a, a world that is cursed because of sin. We experience uh, the decay of the body. We experience death. There's Famine, there's nakedness, there's sword, there, there's um, illness and disease and so forth. All these things are occurring, persecution as well. And Paul is trying to give encouragement to the believer to know that 
they are not left alone in this. And in fact, the sufferings that they presently experience in the wider context of things are of little concern. They're just brief, momentary, and light by comparison to the great things God has in store for us. And this is where uh, Paul encourages us to exercise faith, to trust in the word of God, the promises of God, uh, fix our hope on that glorious future that God has for us in Christ, and to be assured of that great future in view of that which God has already done for us in Christ, giving us his spirit who intercedes for us and prays for us and with us. So, what then shall we say to all these things, particularly this last great concatenation of uh, things, uh, calling, justification, and glorification? Well, uh, the, the, the only conclusion he, we can come to is this in the form of a question. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, when he raises the question, if God is for us, it's not as though there's some uncertainty in Paul's mind as to, is God really for us? Is that indeed the case? No, he, he, he's very confident of the fact that God indeed is for us. He is committed to us and to our salvation. And he's going to unpack that for us here even further as we go along here. But he doesn't operate out of the, 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 the realm of skepticism, doubt, uh, questioning, is God for me or not? No, it's if God is for us as he certainly is, as we've already shown and demonstrated him to be, he's obviously for us, then who can be against us? And so, again... Paul's reasoning things out for us here, helping us to think through them. And this is good, you know, in terms of providing counsel to friends and family members alike. Um, work it through for yourself. Think things through from premises to conclusion. Um, if God is for you, as he truly is, then who can be against you? Understand what that is saying. First of it, it brings to our attention who is this God who is for us? He is the eternal creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who eternally exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, the one who has sent his Son into this world as an act of his love to obtain our salvation. It is this God that is for us. Not the God of the modernist or the, the liberal or the pantheist or what have you, where God is a, a ground of being, a kind of uh, a world spirit at work in all of life and um, kind of involved in the evolutionary process along with us over time, living for billions and billions of years, I guess. Um, this is not the God that Paul brings to our attention. So, your theology of God, your understanding of God, bears great blessings and fruit for you. As you understand his nature, who he is, and what he's done for us, that bears great fruit in terms of your personal assurance and sense of security in Christ. You see, I think Paul is kind of addressing the, the kinds of things that work away and eat at our hearts. Am I in Christ? Um, has God really done a great work? Is there not more that I need to do in order to be saved? It's kind of, the, as I've expressed before, it's kind of the default position of our human hearts that we want to go and think, well, there's something else that I have to do, something else I have to achieve. Um, and that's always a slippery slope. It always will lead us astray from the gospel of grace. So if God is for us, who can be against us? Um, and, and Paul is going to talk about who that might be here as we go along. But basically, there's nobody who is greater than God, who can oppose God, who can resist God. The almighty God, the infinitely powerful, all-wise, all-knowing, all-gracious and good, this God has set himself for your salvation. Who's going to stop that? Satan? 
demons, world leaders, persecution, uh, sufferings, all kinds of problems in this life, even your dying, is that really going to stop God from saving you? Uh, the notion of that is just uh, absurd. God himself has set himself to be our savior. And now verse 32, uh, Paul develops that. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Here's a third question now, three questions in a row, and there are more to come. Um, how will he not also with Christ graciously give us all things? Again, Paul helping us to get out of ourselves, think through this wonderful uh, description of God's grace, unpack it for ourselves, explore the riches of God's goodness and love to us in Christ. Um, we need to consider everything that God has for us. And, and he begins with this amazing, amazing thought. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Uh, I would think that for uh, a Jewish believer, their minds would be brought back to the time when God commanded Abraham to take his son Isaac, uh, the one whom he loved, his only son, take him up to the hill, Mount Moriah, and offer his son up as a sacrifice uh, there on, on the mountain. And what did Abraham do? He obeyed God. He took his son. He went up to that mountain, and he was about to strike his son, who was uh, tied up on an altar. He was about to strike him and slaughter his son like a lamb when the angel of the Lord interfered and stopped him and said, um, uh, uh, now that I, I, I know that you uh, trust in the Lord, you've not withheld your, your very own son. And the angel pointed him to a lamb that was stuck in the bushes. There is a greater substitute in mind. Isaac is not the one to save us from our sins. There will be one yet to come, and there is a lamb uh, available for us in the future. And so God was setting the stage and opening up our minds to appreciate the fact that what he is going to do is greater than what Abraham was prepared to do. He was going to send his own son, the eternal son of the father, into this world, taking on our humanity to uh, uh, obtain our salvation. Now, we, we should pay attention to the language that Paul uses here. He did not spare his own son. That's not just simply saying that God was willing to uh, send his son into the world and do without his fellowship for a period of time, send him out into the world and allow him to, to, to do some things in the world. Uh, this idea of sparing him is, uh, God did not spare him from the, the sentence of justice. It was the fact that God would send his own son to the cross and lay our sins on him there at the cross and then punish his son for us, his innocent son who lived perfectly, who loved the father perfectly in the course of his life. This son who came from the very bosom of the father, this son would be given up as a sacrifice for sin. This son would be the object of the wrath of God for sin. And it is this son that God did not spare. Not one Lash of justice was withheld from his son. Each stroke of the rod, each uh, uh, expression of the wrath of God for our sin was fully met on Jesus there at the cross. He did not spare his own son. That speaks to the inflexible justice of God that our sins must be atoned for. We must, they must be punished either in ourselves or in a substitute. And God was pleased to send his son as a substitute for us to bear the penalty for sin so that we might ha not have to face that punishment. That's an amazing thought. 
That's the gospel there. Christ, our substitute, bearing our sins. And God did not spare his own son. I should remind you as well that the son coming into the world was not betrayed by his father, was not surprised by the father's actions here, but rather the son voluntarily came into the world for this very purpose. There was an agreement between the father and the son in eternity past that the son would indeed go and be a sacrifice for sin and bear the full wrath for our sins on himself. So the father not sparing the son was not something where the son was caught by surprise and suddenly the father's angry with him and he couldn't understand it and was dragged off to the cross and put to death. No, the son freely lays down his life, as he said to his disciples. I think it's John chapter 10. No one takes his life from him. He lays it down on his own, on his own initiative. This was the son's voluntary sacrifice of himself for us. The father's voluntary sacrifice of his son for us. And uh, the uh, inflexible justice of God that in the face of punishing his own very own son, the father did not withhold anything that had to be expressed for our justice. So, um, it, when we give some thought to the magnitude of this gift of love for us, uh, it certainly ought to be humbling and should remove all uh, skepticism or doubts with regard to whether God loves us or not. That should be driven out of our minds entirely. Um, God has done this. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Now, in our modern day, our, our liberal friends who, who uh, would claim to be Christians uh, say, I cannot accept the thought that God would punish his son and put him to death on the cross. That I would never do that to my own son. I cannot fathom uh, uh, doing any harm to my son like that. And indeed, on a human level, we would never want to do something like that to family members. In, uh, in fact, we do everything we can to save and preserve and protect family members, um, especially fathers and mothers love their children and do everything, including up to and including laying down their lives for their children so that their children might continue to, to live and, and thrive. That's what a parent's love is all about. But here we have something far greater, far different. Now, I, I, I can make a comparison here to human relationships in that uh, parents might be willing to have their son join the military and fight on their behalf to protect them against a foreign invader. And that son in going out into battle may lose his life. And so there may be that voluntary giving of their son, if you will, relinquishing their son to this battle because there's a greater end and objective in mind. Uh, Perhaps on a human level, we can then understand something of what God is doing in sending his son to bear the penalty for our sins. There was a larger objective in mind, the salvation of all of God's people. And the death of the son at the cross was a momentary thing whereby he achieved our salvation. And it was not the end of things. But after his sufferings, he was raised from the dead exalted into heaven, as we're going to see here in a moment, and now watches over us and preserves us from heaven itself. So um, take a look at the, 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 the wonder of God's love, and if you reject the idea that God gave his son as a substitute for us and punished him in our place on the cross, then you are counting yourself unworthy of being saved. Because it's only in this way that we are saved from our sins. There is no other hope. We are not able to save ourselves. And except God does this, we must perish. And if you will not believe that God accomplished this for you, 
then you have no understanding of the gospel, the richness of the gospel, the wonder of God's great love, and the, the, the greatness of his work in saving us from our sins. You also don't understand the gravity of our sin and the consequences that it brings into life. So God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Now, again, here's that universal language that the Arminian might, or the universalist might cling to and say, there, you see, God gave his son up for us all. Well, the question is, who is the us of whom Paul speaks? Clearly, the context is those whom God has chosen. I'll just go back a few verses to uh, verses 29 and 30. It's those whom he foreknew and predestined, uh, called, justified, and glorified. It's these people for whom God gave up his son. It's for all of God's elect people. Now, the universalist side of that is that for all those whom God has chosen, they're all saved. They all participate in this love of God. They all have their sins forgiven. Uh, and and it, it doesn't matter where they are at in life, what they achieved or failed to achieve or what, what have you. They're all universally, completely the objects of God's great love for us. So the universalism is in the sense that for all of God's elect, God gave his son to save them from their sins. And none of us will fail to receive that gift. And so here is the great gift that God places before us. And then the, the, the concluding uh, clause here in the form of a question is how we not also with him graciously give us all things. So there's this added benefit. God has given us his son, and that's the greatest, most precious thing that he could give to achieve our salvation. He is committed. He has given himself up for that for, for your salvation. Now, there are other things that we might need along the way. Can is it reasonable to think that God would fail to give the, these easier things for us if he's already given us the most precious and most valuable thing uh, to be given? It doesn't make any sense. He will give us all that we need for our salvation. And so God stands with us at every step along the way, making sure that we have all that we need to be saved. And so we are here talking not only about irresistible grace, but also the preservation of the saints. How God does everything necessary to bring us to that final conclusion of being rescued from sin, delivered from death, uh, brought to eternal life, glorified, raised with the Son, uh, dwelling in an eternal, uh, a, a new heavens and a new earth. So uh, he will... With, with the Son, graciously give us all things. So this is a, a tremendous measure of uh, mercy and grace displayed to us. Uh, you know, we're in the Christmas season thinking of giving gifts. We give gifts to our children. Um, think of God's great gift for you and his Son and the salvation that comes in him far surpasses anything else. Verse 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Okay, so we have another answer as to um, who is the us in verse 32. He gave him up for us all. Well, it's God's elect, verse 33. In case we had any question about that, Paul immediately confirms it. So it's the elect before that. It's the elect after that. In the middle, us all, it's the elect. The context surrounding that governs our interpretation of the all uh, that are the object of God's great love. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? So this gets us back into the atmosphere of justification, uh, the, um, the, the realm of uh, our being declared righteous and innocent in God's sight. Uh, who can bring a charge? And you, you think, again, in, in Old Testament history of Satan, the accuser of the brethren, and the vision 
um, in, in the book of Zechariah of the high priest Joshua standing before the Lord with filthy garments and Satan that aside uh, accusing him and uh, the Lord rebukes the devil and clothes the high priest with linen garments, spotless, white, and clean. God is the one who justifies us at the end of verse 33. And so, verse 34, who is to condemn? Uh, you need not fear the accusations of the evil one. He is like a prosecuting attorney. And thankfully, I've never been the object of a prosecutor's attack. <laughs> and I hope you've never been either. Uh, it can be very, uh, I'm sure it can be very unsettling and, and frightening to have uh, a, a, a lawyer coming after you and accusing you of a crime or something and you having to give a defense for yourself. Um, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Satan is the accuser of the brethren, but he is answered. He is resisted. God has answered him. He is the one who justifies us. And so we can take great comfort in that. Uh, who is to condemn? Justification and condemnation are opposites. Uh, we are justified in Christ as a once-for-all act whereby we are declared righteous in God's sight, uh, the wicked are condemned. Uh, they are declared wicked, guilty, and subject to the wrath of God, and they are given over to the consequences of their wickedness. Uh, so God is the one who justifies, and Paul has in mind here, I think, God the Father. Uh, is the Father who sent his own Son. And so we are once more... Uh, brought into the, the relations, the interrelations of the Trinity, and the Father is the one who initiates the work of salvation in the sending of his own Son. And God is the one who justifies. It's the Father who declares us righteous in his sight. Um, he is the one who justifies. Um, and now, uh, verse 34, we go beyond that. Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, was who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Now, that really flows into the next verse, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, but let's uh, stay with verse 34 for a moment. Um, Christ is the one who died. Um, so we've spoken about the Father's great love for us and his sending of the Son and declaring us justified. Now the Son comes into view and his own activity is placed before us and he is the one who died. Uh, he yielded his life over to death for us and that uh, the death as a substitute for us for our sins on the cross. And so... We see here the, 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 the marvel and the beauty of God's great love that Christ voluntarily goes to lay down his life for us. He is the one who's done these things. Now, if he's laid down his life for us, then more than that, Paul says, Jesus lays it down and he has the authority to lay it down and to take it up again. And so he's very active in that as well. The son is, was raised, is at the right hand. So we have not only his resurrection from the dead and appearance to the disciples on earth, but his ascension into heaven and his entrance into his heavenly role, his heavenly session as our prophet, priest, and king in heaven. He's at the right hand of God, which is the place of authority. It's a place uh, next to the king, which is second only to the king. You think of, uh, again, going back to Israel's experience of Joseph in Egypt, uh, being the second only unto Pharaoh. And there was considerable authority given to Joseph to rule the land of Egypt for Pharaoh and to uh, prepare Egypt for the famine that was to come and so forth. Jesus is greater than Joseph of long ago. Jesus is the second only to the Father. And he rules over the kingdom of God uh, for the glory of the Father. And will, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, will one day deliver over the kingdom to the Father so that God may be all in all. 
but he is at the right hand of God uh, with full authority from God to uh, act in history and time to save the people for whom he died. And to that end, he is not only our king who rules us, he is our priest who intercedes for us. And note the language here, it's a present tense verb. He is interceding. This is something of an ongoing work that the Lord Jesus is engaged in even now for us in heaven. He continually prays for us that God would protect us from the evil one and bring us safely through this world. So if Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of God praying to the Father for us, will the Father turn down his Son whom he loves, who has fulfilled his will perfectly and whom he uh, honored by raising from the dead and placing him at his right hand? Will the Father reject the requests of the Son on our behalf? Uh, that's inconceivable. Jesus is interceding for us in heaven. And so uh, one, one more uh, reason to be uh, encouraged. Remember, we talked earlier about the Spirit of God at work within us here on earth and how he prays for us uh, with language that's too deep for words. The Son in heaven prays for us as well and intercedes for us. Is it possible then that we can lose our salvation? Is that even conceivable that that salvation can be lost? If God is the one who justifies, if Christ is the one who died, was raised, ascended into heaven, and prays for us, if these things are true, is it possible that somehow your salvation can be lost, that you can so foul up God's work that you can be lost. God's elect will indeed be saved. So um, he continues, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Um, this is a great question. Uh, we come directly into the presence of the Lord Jesus in heaven who loves you and has committed himself to you in every way. Can anyone stop him from loving you, the one who knows you fully, perfectly, and completely? And uh, so there is that uh, sense that if, if Jesus knows us perfectly and completely, knows that we were sinners, knows as well that we've been redeemed, that he has placed his spirit upon us, placed the name of God upon us, and dwells us himself, can anyone separate us from that kind of a love? Uh, again, it's not um, possible. Uh, I saw a flash before my screen here, a note from Justin, if we fail to repent, uh, then we will perish. Well, yeah, that's true. Uh, the unbeliever fails to repent, and he will perish. The believer repents. Indeed, we're called to a, a life of repentance. That kind of, if I can take a, a detour back into my sermon last week, uh, the message of the, the apostles going out into the communities of Israel was a message of repentance, uh, calling them to conversion, turning away from sin and turning to God. And the believer continually lives a life of repentance. Jesus taught us to pray in uh, the Lord's Prayer, uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That should be a continual part of our experience as believers. And if you're not repenting of sin, then that's kind of evidence that you are not truly a believer. Uh, those who repent are those who are saved. Um, and they are the ones whom Jesus loves. He loves them because uh, his, his spirit has worked within them a, a, a humbling of the heart and a, a, a repentant heart that turns from sin and turns to him for forgiveness. So who shall separate us from this love of Christ? The Father loves us. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. The Son loves us and that he died, rose again, and lives in heaven at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. The Father loves us, the Son loves us. So then, 
Another question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, nakedness or danger or sword? Um, and then Paul's going to give a quote here. Uh, I can't read and <laughs> comment at the same time, so I'll try to get back to some of the comments. Um, it, Paul goes through the kinds of things that go through our minds. Remember now, the, these Roman believers, Roman Christians, will pretty soon here undergo severe persecution with Nero and uh, his uh, attacking of the Christians, burning them at the stake, making them like candles in his gardens, and then feeding them to the lions. Christians were going to go through severe persecution. Uh, Paul himself would be executed in Rome. Peter would be executed in Rome. Uh, the church was going to suffer quite a, a bit uh, from persecution. Um, so uh, we uh, ha have this come to our attention here, and, and the question becomes, if I were to face this kind of intense persecution, would I continue to be faithful to Christ, or would I deny him? And certainly when we look at ourselves, we look at our flesh, we wonder and are concerned and fear that maybe I will be weak at that moment and I'll do something horrible and betray the Lord, deny him. Now, Peter denied the Lord three times and that was a terrible thing, but God forgave him. God is able to forgive us for our sins. But in the end, even persecution, however fierce it might be, and whatever kinds of things we might do in the midst of that, in a sinful way through our own weakness, God will nonetheless preserve us and keep us in Christ. Tribulation, distress, the, the troubles of this life, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword, none of these things can hinder us from an entrance into the kingdom of God. And so uh, Paul uh, gives us a, a, quote, a citation here from Psalm 44, verse 22, which we can look at in a moment. Uh, for your sake, the psalmist says, we are being killed all the day, all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. That's kind of a tough thing. <laughs> it's this reminder that Christians suffer in this life. And sometimes some Christians are given over to uh, severe persecution leading to their they're being killed for the sake of Christ. Um, that's part of the experience of the church in this world and in this life. Uh, but <clears throat> note how the psalmist couches the, this uh, human suffering. It's for your sake. In view of our union with Christ, in view of the fact that we're not acting alone, but we have Christ watching over us from heaven, for the Lord's sake, for his glory, we are being killed all the day long and regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. The wicked look on us in that way. We don't have the power. We don't have the levers of power in our culture and our society today. Uh, the elites of our culture can uh, dictate terms and move people as they wish and may indeed uh, bring about severe persecution for the church. We need not fear that. No, verse 37, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Paul is not uh, bringing to our attention a kind of triumphalism in the sense that, you know, everything's going to go right in your life. Uh, you'll defeat everyone in court. You will overcome your uh, enemies. Every conversation you have, you will be the victor in that conversation. Um, you know, all these things are going to go well for you. Whenever I step on the court of basketball, I'm going to defeat Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant because <laughs> I'm a believer. Um, we are more than conquerors, but Paul is speaking of the fact in, in terms of our, of our election, our salvation, uh, the glorification that is laid up for us in Christ. Uh, we overcome the evil one and all of his intentions for us, because we are joined to Christ, Christ works on our behalf, his spirit is within us, he prays for us in heaven, he preserves us by his great power, 
We then are more than conquerors. We will be victorious. We overcome uh, sin and uh, we will indeed rise from the dead. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. It's all in virtue of our union with Christ and in the expression of his love for us. And then Paul brings us to a grand conclusion by saying, I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul universalizes the opposition and whatever you want to look at, whether it's the the uh, demonic hosts that are scattered about uh, all of uh, uh, this world, um, or however you look at these things, we will be victorious. Nothing will be able to separate us from God's love, love which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So be encouraged and comforted in knowing that God has done everything necessary for your salvation and you will not fail because it's not up to you. God himself is powerfully bringing you to himself. He is your savior. He loves you and he will bring you safely into that eternal age. So I hope that uh, the exploration of that, the meditation on that, the uh, examining the, the depths of God's love for us and the reminder of the, the magnitude of what has occurred on our behalf, I hope that begins to work in our hearts and enables us to trust in God more and more with each day and not be fearful, anxious, guilty, um, upset uh, that things don't go right for us in this life and so forth. We can look beyond these things to our covenant-keeping God who has brought us to himself through Christ and has given to us eternal life. Well, I'll finish here and give you an opportunity to respond, uh, and I'll see if I can get caught up on any comments that were made along the way here. Okay. Rich. Yeah. It's interesting that uh, when you look at that uh, 34, uh, he says, who can separate us from the love of God? He, he puts that in a personal pronoun, who? And then he gives seven what's. I interpret that as you cannot separate yourself. Don't separate himself from you. True. And yeah. so we're talking about those seven things. We're talking about God's providence. Yeah. Whether it be rheumatoid arthritis, whether it be uh, people shooting rockets over in Ukraine, whatever God's providence is, it's God's providence and it's meant for you. We go back to Romans 8, 28, 29, that we are to use that to grow and change, become more like Christ. So um, uh, it's really quite amazing uh, it's countercultural and it's counterintuitive what he said in those verses. Absolutely, yeah. It goes against our guilty conscience. <laughs> our, our conscience sometimes speaks up and says, no, you're going to lose, you're going to die, you're going to fail some way along the way. And we tend to look very much at ourselves and our sin and focus on that rather than look to our Savior, to his glory in heaven and the magnitude of God's great love for us. So there needs to be this change in our perspective. Think of what Paul says in Colossians chapter three to fix your eyes on Jesus. Uh, let me see if I can get that in front of you here. If you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with God, with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So there needs to be that heavenly mindedness to our hearts and minds. Uh, that focuses on 
Christ in heaven and all that he has achieved for us and allowing that to answer the accusations of the evil one, the accusations of our own hearts in terms of our own sin and the, the you know, corruption of that sin. Um, rest in Jesus. It's, it's interesting. Um, if, if I were to listen, if, if I were to read the whole book of Romans, which I couldn't do, I had to keep stopping and looking at things. It, it, I can't get through the first page without reading something twice or three times. But if it was, say, professionally narrated, and I heard the entire thing in one sitting without stopping, and then I had a test on it, forget about anything else. I just had to explain what I read, what I what I heard. Yeah. I don't see how I could possibly deny <laughs> that Paul that, that that Paul is talking about saying that we can't do it for ourselves, and, and that there's an elect group. I, how could someone possibly deny that? Because it's in context with the entire the entire book, it's it's undeniable. Um, I don't see how it would be possible unless maybe someone wasn't saved to, to possibly go through this entire book and not see that. Well, you have man's uh, amazing capacity to rationalize things and to excuse themselves or to flatter themselves by um, thinking they can do things that they really can't. Um, when you are committed to the fact that um, you're the one that makes that choice and it's up to you to make that choice and you've made it and so you will be saved, then you, be, you kind of ex begin to explain things away, like, like God's foreknowledge. Well, that's just knowing in advance. And God's choice. Well, that's just seeing uh, who was going to choose him, and then he responds by choosing them back. And, and so you begin to explain away things that are pretty obviously uh, different than, than what they're saying. And um, so the capacity of, of our hearts and the mind in rebellion against God to explain clear and obvious truths away uh, with kind of these thin veneers of uh, uh, reason and so forth. Uh, it, it's truly remarkable. Um, Calvin described the human heart as a, a factory of idols and as constantly churning out idols. And um, the, that's true. Our, our, our minds, our hearts are, are continually engaged in rebellion, except God changes our hearts and opens our eyes to see the truth of, of his word. We live the lie, uh, Rich. Uh, that's a result of, uh, of the fall. We just live the lie. We yeah. like the lie more than we like the truth, and we find it. Uh, you know, it's uh, Paul lived the lie. Yep. And uh, but he didn't live the lie after he was saved. And he could have, you know, we, we, we see in scripture, like uh, in Luke uh, 15, the, the uh, prodigal came to his senses. We all have to come to our senses. Some of us come later, and some of us come earlier. And then even when we come to our senses, there's still a coming to our senses that is always growing as we come to our senses as our as our knowledge of god increases you know it, it's like it's like uh Sproul said if we don't grasp the holiness of god we're not going to see how bad sin is we're not going to see how bad we are we won't know his grace and we'll be be uh we'll be uh, all otosolarologists all, all trying to save ourselves or just suck it up and go yeah yeah and, and that really explains what you have in, uh, you know, much of the Arminian evangelical world, the Roman Catholic world, um, uh, other aspects where uh, certainly liberalism, where there, there's some sort of uh, appeal to self and what self can accomplish rather than resting entirely on Christ and what he has done for us. And we fail to see the, the magnitude of the gift that he's given to us. And we, we really kind of flatter ourselves in thinking that there's something that I can do that in some way um, satisfies God's righteousness. Um, uh, 
I feel like I give myself an excuse more than I would like to admit, you know, because um, every every moment's a time for me to come to the Lord, and yeah. I put it on the on the back uh, stove, you know, and uh, try to do it all at once when I'm reading or meditating when I'm reading the Bible instead of coming right then and there and doing what I ought to do. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Sometimes we, we just kind of try to uh, justify ourselves, explain away our sin, um, say it's not that big a deal. You know, everybody else is doing it, whatever, you know. And uh, we make light of what God takes very seriously. And uh, we need to repent sometimes of our, um, the, the, the weak, frail repentance that we have. Uh, we, we don't fully appreciate the gravity of sin and the enormity of the judgment that awaits those who are wicked and the enormity of what God has done to overcome all of that. You know, Rich, uh, you, know, you go back to the uh, the temptation to be like God, knowing good and evil. So their desire was to be like God. They had nothing in them. They had only this serpent or, uh, that gave false counsel. We don't know of any other talking animal uh, in the garden. Okay? So it was a very interesting thing. But to be like God, and I think that's that's really the essence of idolatry. These things are not our, our, our idols. I mean, I've read Calvin and all that, but you're, you're still for the idol. You want to create your own world. That's what we do. Yeah. We create our own world. Yeah. And it can look different in different ways. Uh, um, mm -hmm. So. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, the, bur the burden of self. That's a, that's a hard one to overcome. Something we need to, I guess, work on all day long, every day. <laughs> well, I put sin, self, and Satan. I put those three as a trio, okay? And uh, uh, and how Satan works. Why he would pick on you instead of this guy over here? And how does he do that? I mean, those are, those are things that are hard to, to really come through. But uh, in some ways, we don't need Satan. We got uh, our own remaining sinful. I, I digress. <laughs> yeah, God's got to raise up a, 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 a godly politician. We just don't know where they are. There are some there. Um, well, that McCarthy may be. I don't know. I think Johnson there, who's the new Speaker of the House. That's right. That's right. Maybe the maybe the person that we, except they're they're vilifying him pretty badly in the press and. And all he's going to have to withstand a lot. Mm. That's how you know he's uh, on the right track, right? Because right. Uh, right. Yeah. I, the ones that work the most. The yeah. Lord said the godly will be persecuted. <laughs> he's giving it. Yeah. yeah. 